Good evening. Well, let's start this again. Uh, welcome to our first Tuesday Talks at the Atwood for 2022. I'm Kevin Wright, uh, your host and executive director of the museum. And we have lined up what I believe is a very good lecture series for the upcoming season. So please keep checking our website for updated information. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, I want to share a few housekeeping items. Uh, the Atwood Museum is currently closed for exhibits as we pre prepare three new exhibits that will open on the weekends in May. The Clubs of Chatham, a century of summer leisure, will be on display in our main gallery. Another new exhibit will be Weird, Wacky and Wonderful, a fun exhibit that will highlight the curiosities of our collections. The final exhibit uh, opening this year will be Alice Stalnick, American Regionalist, Re Regionalist uh, Beyond the Murals. This exhibit will showcase some of Alice's lesser known works. Another exciting addition to the Atwood this year will be our new summer concert series. Six concerts with a diverse group of performers and they'll take place during June, July, and August. So please stay tuned for those details. Our next lecture will take place on Tuesday, February 15th at five o'clock as we commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Pendleton Rescue. Casey Sherman, co-author of The Finest Hours will be our guest speaker. Reservations are now available on our website. Membership renewals are now due, so please be on the lookout for your renewal letter. Uh, we anticipate a wonderful year at the Atwood Museum. We hope you make plans to be a part of it. If you have comments for our speaker during the lecture, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Bill, Bill will respond throughout his talk and immediately following the lecture. If you like this evening's talk, please consider making a donation. Every dollar donated helps us to bring programming like this to our audience. For your convenience, Christina will be adding a link to the chat. And thank you. I've talked enough. Allow me to introduce our special guest. A wash ashore from Western Massachusetts, Bill Burke is a National Park Service employee who serves as the historian for the National Seashore. He has worked there in a number of roles over the past 25 years. He assists researchers and educators by providing access to the park's collection of archives, historic photographs, and objects. The National Seashore contains a treasure trove of historic things, including homes, archeological sites, and landscapes. Bill enjoys pondering the meaning of all and teaching as well as learning from others about our small universe of the Outer Cape. Bill holds a BA in History Summa Cum Laude from Providence College and an MA in Colonial American History and Historical Archaeological uh, from the uh, Archaeology from the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. He has worked at several national parks from Massachusetts to Virginia. He also coaches the Monomoy High School girls tennis team, which reached the quarterfinals in last spring's Southeastern Mass State Tournament. He occasionally lectures from the Open University of Wellfleet and lives in Har Harwich with his wife and three daughters. It is my honor to welcome Bill Burke. Hi everybody, I hope everyone is doing well tonight. I'm Bill Burke and we'll be talking about Cape Cod National Seashore at 60. 60 years ago, um, last year, 61 years this year, the National Seashore was authorized by Congress, signed by President Kennedy. And I stand here tonight in the, uh, the deep bowels and recesses of the visitor center in East Ham. And I'm here to tell you the story of the creation of the National Seashore and, and then uh, what's happened in the last 60 years at the park. That's a, that's a lot to talk about. Uh, so it's gonna be hopefully quick hitting. We're gonna kind of break it into two parts. Uh, the first part is really the years leading up to the creation of the National Seashore. And then we go to uh, take some comments or questions. And then we'll go from there, wrap up the last 60 years of the National Seashore. You know, when I first started at the National Seashore, I, I arrived up at Race Point Ranger Station for my first day. And uh, I remember walking in and there was a, a whole bunch of uh, grizzled veteran looking rangers. 
And uh, I got to talking with them about the work and what it's gonna be like. And uh, I was a little intimidated, but the, 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 the elder statesman at the end of kind of the meet and greet came up to me uh, after a little meeting and said, Bill, remember the first, the most important rule for the new ranger is make sure you stop at stop signs when you're in uniform and in a park vehicle with an arrowhead on the side. And I thought, I thought the advice would have been something different like um, protecting shorebirds or how to walk in the dunes without crushing the beach grass. But the, the takeaway uh, that he was trying to get at was, hey, for the first 30 years of the National Seashore, which was created in 1961, the park service and park employees and park rangers were really trying to build a coalition with the local communities to make this national seashore work because there was a lot of opposition, local opposition to the creation and the concept of the National Park Service and the feds coming to uh, take over the outer beach of Cape Cod. And so if I'm sliding through a stop sign it's just going to give the local residents another uh, example of uh, the overreach of the federal government, the arrogance of federal employees. And so that's always stuck with me. But it's interesting that I think times have changed a bit. The people who were uh, living on Cape Cod and saw the first proposals in the 1950s for the park, you know, many of those people are gone now. And I find that the newer uh, folks coming in, uh, moving to Cape Cod with a second home, uh, or they're just the second or third generation out now, um, there's not as much animosity, but certainly the National Seashore is always uh, challenged with accessibility issues, endangered shorebirds, uh, off-road vehicle access, uh, the, the, the uh, redevelopment of homes that are already within the National Seashore. These are all issues that are really still hot topic issues. So, you know, the National Seashore, when it was first proposed in the 1950s and actually earlier than that in the 1930s, uh, the story of the seashore is really one of innovation, complexity, and controversy. And so the first part of my talk will talk about the, the 1950s in particular and leading up to the uh, 1961 creation of the park. This National Seashore was the first unit of the National Park Service to do several things, some new, new things. First of all, federal money would be used to purchase federal land to create a park. This is the first time that a national park unit was created using federally appropriated money. Up to this point, new parks were created uh, usually from federal lands that were owned by the military or they were donated lands like at Acadia, Everglades, Tetons, donated by the Rockefellers and, and other philanthropists. So this, this was a first. Another first for this national park was the suspension of eminent domain. The National Park Service was going to come in, create a 44,000 acre park, kind of lay it on top of six existing towns, uh, but allow the houses that have been built uh, previously before the park was created to remain. Um, and this park, unlike a lot of the earlier parks, would recognize that there was a way of life here and that people were already hunting on the outer cape and people were already driving vehicles on the beach and surf casting and doing all these things that Cape Codders were doing in the mid 20th century. And those activities would be allowed to continue. So. National Park Service was breaking new ground internally when it, when it tried to create this place. The National Seashore is complex. Uh, when it was created, there were 3,700 land transactions to create this patchwork quilt of a National Seashore. Uh, within the National Seashore, 30% of the lands are actually owned by uh, towns uh, or the state. Uh, so to this day, the state manages the Great Ponds and Wellfleet, for example. And actually 4% of the land in the National Seashore is privately held uh, and approximately 660 houses, private, private homes, uh, reside within the boundary of Cape Cod National Seashore. And it's been controversial. Like I said earlier, everything from the, 
the uh, shorebird protection measures that we take, the off-road vehicle routes that were established, uh, regulating uh, hunting. Um, what do we do when there's houses along the shoreline that run out of land because of uh, coastal erosion? Where do those go? What will be the impact of this new national seashore in terms of tax base? Because the creation of the national seashore meant that a lot of land was being taken off of the future tax revenues because no new construction would, would happen. And what would be the effects of the national seashore on the local economy? Would the federal government, by creating food concessions and campgrounds, would we, the National Park Service, put local business and mom and pop businesses out of business? So there were a lot of concerns and a lot of questions that had to be worked out. So let's take a little journey uh, with our images. And here we go. Cape Cod National Seashore at 60, a dream come true. Okay, I need to advance my slides. And I'm unable to do that right now. Maybe John or Christina can help me through that. Can you try hitting the space bar? Uh, so I'm using the up and down arrows. And that's not helping. Uh, you can try either the left and right or the space bar to bounce through. Could I reload that whole thing? Yeah, let's try that. No, still not letting me advance slides. If you exit out of the PowerPoint, uh, the slideshow rather. Okay, Christina, should I again try to share screen and start again or close yeah. out the whole thing? Yeah, let's try that. Uh, let me open up this different slide and see. Yeah. You click from beginning and then. Okay, I think that might do it. Yes, thank you. Okay. So in the 1950s, we go back. Uh, the local paper, the Cape Cotter, uh, was very interested in the topic of this newly proposed national seashore. And one of the political cartoons really captures uh, what the Cape Codder felt was kind of a tipping point in the Outer Cape's history. Would Cape Cod become a honky-tonk place with uh, pizzas on the half shell and uh, the dreary queen as opposed to the dairy queen? Or would it become a pristine, or at least part of the Outer Cape retain its pristine character? The proposed national seashore, uh, which is shown here in the dark orange, would run along the outer beach from Chatham north to uh, 45 miles or so, 50 miles to Provincetown. And the earliest proposals was it would just be a coastal beach a national seashore with very little inland areas. But as the proposals were uh, reworked and reworked over a period of six years, uh, it became apparent that part of the National Seashore would cross over from ocean to bay, as you can see in Wellfleet, and it would encompass many of the state park lands that were already in place in Provincetown and Truro. And the earliest proposals for Chatham was simply that the outer beach would become within the boundary of the National Seashore, uh, but it would also include Morris Island and um, Harding's Beach. And, the earliest proposals actually included Monomoy Island as being part of the new national seashore. 
So if we go back in time to Cape Cod, say in the 1930s on the outer Cape, there, were, there was very little uh, official recreation or uh, tourism. And in Wellfleet, this was what the landscape looked like. Much of the town was open. Uh, and on the outer beach at Cahoon Hollow, the only tourists that you would find would be people who were brave enough to take uh, vehicles back in the 30s and 40s and would kind of lay a stake out and a claim out to camp on the bluff. And I had the good fortune of talking with a fellow from New Jersey, and these are his family photos from the late 30s into the right before the war. And uh, they would bribe the Coast Guard with cartons of cigarettes and the Coast Guard tractor guys would pull his car up on top of the bluff and they'd pitch their tent. And then the family would really just spend all summer kind of hanging out at the beach. And they would go down in East Orleans to the duck farm and adopt a couple of ducks for the summer. And they did this over and over summer after summer. So it was a simpler time there really wasn't much development in Truro, Wellfleet in particular, towards the outer beach. The National Park Service became interested in the potential beach access potential for Cape Cod. In fact, uh, six, it was found that 6% of the 3,700 miles of the US coastline in the 50s was only 6% was available for public rec recreation. So the National Park Service was trying to think outside of its traditional box of big Western parks and wanted to create national parks in the East that were recreation, recreational based and, and were within a day's drive of uh, uh, about a third of the Eastern seaboard. And this is an image from the early park proposal uh, documents showing Hey, you could drive from Virginia Beach up to Cape Cod. That's a long drive, but you're kind of within a day's long day's drive or two days drive to this place to uh, have open beach recreation. Um, and I think everyone on Cape Cod was already experiencing by after World War II with post-war prosperity, the rise of interstate highways, the baby boom population that Cape Cod population was already starting to accelerate through the 50s into the 80s and you know we know we know beyond that. I'm sure many of you in the audience tonight are baby boomers. These were people born between 1946 and 1964. So you can raise your hand if you're a boomer. I won't see you, but you can do it anyway. Um, so these were the, the future constituents, the future users that was in the vision of the National, uh, National Park Service. So as we get closer to the midway point of this program, I want you to be thinking about any questions or stories or comments that you have about the 1950s and this phenomenon of creating a national, national park, a national seashore that would serve all these people looking for public access to our shoreline. Right, so you can just type those into the chat and we'll get to those in a minute. Um, so looking here in Truro, looking north, northwest towards Provincetown, much of the dunes had not been developed and really Provincetown had always been a, a, a town that was confined by state park lands and so most of the town was just along the, uh, the shoreline. You know, there was a lot of uh, development going on in, on the East Coast in particular, Ocean City, Maryland pictured here was highly developed during the 1950s. And so National Park Service, as well as a lot of other local communities and states and counties and towns were looking for ways of curbing overdevelopment and uh, they saw the Outer Cape as being ripe for quick development if um, lands were not taken for rec you know, recreation and preservation. So oftentimes in the 50s, you'd see these roads that would, were already laid out and lots were laid out and you could start buying lots for pretty cheap. Uh, I know just saw an archival photo of a uh, subdivision in Truro, you could buy a half acre lot for $900. So land was cheap and uh, you got in on that early on, you did well. 
even our uh, prized Fort Hill in East Ham had already been subdivided up and construction would be starting soon on the Fort Hill estates. But there was a lot of opposition to the national seashore and the concept of a national seashore. Um, some of the early national parks that were created well before Cape Cod, like here we are at the Grand Tetons, these were parks that were filled with controversy when they were being created. At the Tetons, for example, uh, there was a lot of resistance from the local community, many of whom raised cattle near and around the Grand Teton range. And so the National Park Service really had to try to work closely with the local community to try to uh, get some consensus on how much land would be acquired. The federal government, in this case, acquired the mountain range itself in the 1920s and declared it part of the Grand Teton National Monument. But the other lands, many, many of the acres were purchased by the Rockefeller family and then eventually added to Grand Teton to create a national park by the Truman administration. Other national parks um, we know, like the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia, and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park south of there, those parks were created out of lands that had been settled already. And many of the mountain families were displaced by those national parks. So the, the National Park Service was really trying to learn its lessons in some painful earlier attempts at park creation. One thing I think uh, that the National Park Service knew was that the traditional uses that were occurring here pre-National Seashore really should be allowed to continue. These were ways of life for people, surf casting, camping on the beach, driving on the beach, hunting, fishing. So uh, over a five-year period, uh, congressional delegates, Senate delegates from the House Subcommittee on Public Lands came to Cape Cod to hammer out the final boundary. On the left here is Senator Leverett Saltonstall, the Massachusetts United States Senator, who was instrumental along with Kennedy, who was a Senator at the time, to write some of the early legislation. And that was drafted and recrafted over the years. There were a lot of prominent uh, folks who lived on Cape Cod who you would think were in favor of a national seashore, but actually uh, they turned out early on to be opposed. Uh, Francis Biddle, who was a prominent um, historical figure as Attorney General under Franklin Delano Roosevelt during World War II, uh, they had acquired a property shortly after the war in Wellfleet. And uh, the Biddles initially came out opposed to the concept of park, feeling like it was an overreach of federal authority. And I think the fact that they own, already owned a house within the proposed boundary that didn't that that felt a little unsettling to them. Uh, the house that they had acquired was an old Cape style house built in 1790. There were several public hearings of which I wish I was uh, a fly on the wall to. We do have the archival records that record all of the people who spoke at these meetings uh, here at the front of the room. This is at I believe East Ham Town Hall. There were two hearings there. In this particular hearing in the center there with the glasses is Senator Saltonstall and two figures to the left of him is Hastings Keith, who is the ninth district representative in Congress, uh, who was a little more reluctant to support the national seashore. So uh, the people um, from Congress and from the Senate would be up in front and they'd be taking the brunt of the, uh, the negative public comments. So, some of the comments uh, said at this meeting, and there, there were two in Chatham as well. I'm just gonna briefly read you some of the comments. One person felt as though the proponents of this miserable proposition through their almost total ignorance of the true state of affairs now realize that most all of the outer beach is dangerous and unfit for swimming by the public. Another person said here, I have lived here all my life and would sure hate to see us overrun with campers and hot dog stands, which will happen if the park is foisted upon us. Uh, another one went on to say, another uh, 
critic of the park went on to say, we are advised that we must acquire more and more public land for recreational purposes. Yet Russia is virtually all public lands and, and are the inhabitants any happier? Uh, so there was a lot of vitriol. There was a lot of mistrust of federal overreach of power and authority and land grabbing um, that brought into the question whether this park could even be created. A lot of compromises had to be made to get to the point in this image showing President Kennedy signing the uh, legislation authorizing the creation of Cape Cod National Seashore. And we know that some of the compromises were that any houses that were built prior to 1959 would be allowed to remain within the park, thus creating about 660 pretty permanent inholdings, private inholdings. Uh, and that the Park Service would create an advisory commission, which was a citizen advisory board that would meet quarterly and be able to talk to the park superintendent about issues bothering them. And that the traditional uses um, that had been identified in the early research would be allowed to continue like off-road vehicle use on the beaches and hunting, for example. So that's the first phase of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, the early years, the thinking behind the proposition to create a national seashore. And I wanted to see if we've got any questions via the chat or comments or stories. We, we do. So we have a couple. Um, start off with one saying, can people who own homes within the national seashore sell them? Yes. So if, if your house was built before September of 1959, uh, you can keep your house into infinity or sell it on the open real estate market, yes. You were basically given a certificate from the park that says uh, there's a suspension of condemnation, uh, which is an important certificate that a real estate agent will need to see. And that tells the potential buyer that the house is, although it's within a national park, it will not be taken by the feds. How many houses could, would you say fall under that category? So there are about 660 private houses wow. uh, that were built pre-park uh, that fall into that category, yes. Another question asked, were there, with the local town meetings, was there a vote to say for the federal government purchasing the land and like a yes vote of majority or anything like that? Uh, yeah, so I think, I know Chatham did take a vote um, at one of those public hearings that you saw an image of from East Ham. In the Chatham vote, um, the Chatham vote, I believe, was 277 to 13 opposed to Cape Cod National Seashore. Um, the main opposition from Chatham was uh, complex and at multiple layers. Um, there was a great fear that this would bring in a lot more traffic to the area. And even though the proposal was only for the National Park Service to take on basically just the outer beach uh, in Chatham, there was a, Chatham had already gone through a lot of uh, angst and political um, ruminating when the Monomoy National Wildlife Ref Refuge was created after World War II. And so Chatham had already kind of wrestled with the, the future vision for the town and, it did not include a large federal presence and uh, the town felt as though they, they were managing their uh, recreational resources in, in, a, in a fine way. Uh, another question, it kind of falls into chat, more chat and specific. And I know you talked about you might not have the answers to very specific period questions, but one anonymous attendee has asked, the original plan was to incorporate large areas of the town of Chatham. Can you comment on the original plan, the final boundary, and please include the contribution of Chatham selectman Robert McNeese of 59 361. Right, Robert McNeese really carried, um, carried the water for, town, for the town of Chatham's response. He attended most of the the uh, subcommittee field meetings that traveled throughout the Cape looking at boundary issues. And he was the one at these uh, public hearings and behind the scenes as well that really rallied the people of Chatham to realize that they didn't really want a lot of this. They didn't wanna be really a part of it. 
Uh, so Morris Island uh, originally was in the boundary of the New National Seashore as well as Harding's Beach. And then I believe I mentioned the earliest version even included the Monomar Wildlife Refuge. So the National Park Service eventually uh, was in my eyes kind of outmaneuvered and really um, out finessed by Robert McNeese and some of the other Chatham uh, selectmen in really laying out to the Park Service the good reasons why they didn't want to really have much land involved with this uh, new national seashore. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the, uh, the chatter is correct that Robert McNeese was the key player and his name is mentioned in a number of accounts in the archive records. And also in um, the book that recently came out, I'll put this on the screen for you, The Greatest Beach uh, by Dr. Ethan Carr, which is a, a beautiful account of everything I'm talking about tonight. And he mentions McNeese uh, on numerous occasions. This book, by the way, is available in, uh, I know it's at, at our bookstore here at the Visitor Center. Mm. Another question along that lines is, are houses built after that 5961 period required to sell on federal to, to the federal government? Right, so any house that was built after September of 59 and up until the time that Kennedy signs the legislation, it's kind of a no man's land time period. There was a lot of uh, quick buying of land, quick throwing up of cottages because people had heard that the National Seashore was going to be signed into law. Uh, but when the park legislation was written and created, they retroactively put the cutoff date for new construction to September 1959, which, which was the month and year of when the final piece of legislation was uh, proposed in Congress. So there was about 75 houses that were built pretty quickly uh, after September 59, and those houses, those owners had to sell to the federal government. And those houses um, were taken by the government at fair market value. And then the owners were given the option of taking up to 25 years of a, of a reservation to continue using the property for a finite amount of time. And then it would turn over completely to the uh, National Park Service. So I know some people have a lot of questions about that. That is one of the most confusing, contentious issues uh, during the first couple of decades of, of the park. But houses that were built before, before after September 59 and uh, up to the time of the Kennedy signing, those owners eventually had to sell to the National Park Service. Okay, that's there's a few more questions kind of along those lines, almost like, one is, can houses be remodeled and or be larger from the original footprint? Yeah, so if you've got a pre-59 house and it's a privately owned house, the uh, condemnation has been suspended. Uh, the National Park Service, one of the things that we gave up uh, authority-wise to get the park created and approved was there is no zoning authority that the National Park Service really has over those inholdings. So if someone in Wellfleet wants to owns a house within the boundary of the park, they go to the town uh, with their plans to enlarge the house and they just adhere to whatever the Wellfleet zoning mm -hmm. regulations are. Uh, I will say that uh, the National Park at the very beginning suggested a zoning guideline, which asked for any house within the National Seashore to really not be enlarged beyond an additional 50% of their square footage. And that was the guideline that we suggested. And to date, only the town of East Ham has uh, taken that up in their own zone and bylaws. Uh, so if you own a house within the boundary in East Ham, you have to follow the rules of East Ham zoning and you could, your ability to really make it a much bigger cottage or house is constrained by that local zoning authority. Mm -hmm. That's it. We actually have quite a few questions coming through. So let me know when you want to stop answering them. I'm trying to find right, something so, that goes along. Right, so we'll, we'll do one more right now and then we'll wrap up and then we'll finish them. Okay. I think this is a good one that kind of, can you speak to the artist shacks of Provincetown and were they treated differently and are they or were they in a trust? Yeah. So the dune shacks 
uh, in, there's 19 dune shacks in Provincetown and Truro. They were treated differently. Uh, they, to give you the current status, they are considered historic. The National Park Service owns 18 of the 19, and they are either with uh, private leases or through uh, organizations like the Pico Hill Trust. Um, they're treated differently because they had no utilities. They were, uh, many of them were, were squatters on public land. Others had proof that they were on land that they owned, but they had no public utilities and no electricity. They were all uh, outhouses and so on. And that didn't meet the definition of the National Park Service improved property. The dune shacks have been uh, such an interesting chapter since I've worked here and uh, we could take up the rest of the program talking about them, but they were treated differently because of their public utility aspect and uh, they are considered historic because of their associations with artists, writers, and other creative uh, people from the uh, Provincetown Truro area. Interesting. All right, so. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah, you. Go ahead. Um, one other question was, are there still public utilities provided for other homes that are in the the seashore jurisdiction? Oh yeah, so, yeah. So there's, um, most houses are on the grid. Um, most, most houses are on their own private wells, but um, yeah, they have access to the power. So there's a lot of cottages, for example, out in the ponds area of Wellfleet and the roads are privately maintained, many of them, but they do have access to uh, the usual utilities. So I think we're gonna wrap up now. So now we're in 1961 and we're gonna, we're gonna wrap up 1961 to the present and let's just talk about the National Seashore a little bit more and how it functions and some of the uh, landmark events. So again, National Seashore, Outer Beach, you know, Provincetown, 90% of the land is National Seashore, 70% of Truro's National Seashore, no new construction within these areas. Hopefully it's about 50-50 and then it gets slow, uh, less and less uh, ratio of federal to private land. And again, the close up of the Chatham area and showing Hard Hardings Beach and Morris Island, which were excluded eventually from the, the new national seashore. Um, there's Morris Island today. So there were, th like I mentioned, 3,700 separate land transactions to create this patchwork park of, of 44,000 acres. Um, a lot of the uh, land was given to the national seashore by a very generous donors. So George Higgins pictured here on the left, uh, signed over, uh, 24 acres of land in his old homestead site, the Atwood Higgins House, which is today the oldest house that the National Seashore owns and operates. Um, so that was a donation from a person who was really concerned about the preservation of the house going forwards. The first park staff is pictured here. This is 1962. There were no park facilities yet, no park headquarters, no visitor center. So the superintendent pictured here, second from right, Robert Gibbs uh, and his staff, mostly of real estate specialists who were gonna acquire these 3,700 parcels of land. They worked out of the Coast Guard station, which had recently been given us to us by the Coast Guard in East Ham. And in the basement of the visitor center was the first meeting of this, uh, the advisory commission, which we really haven't had much time to talk about. The advisory commission is a citizen based committee based uh, with a representative from each Outer Cape town, uh, Provincetown to Chatham. So Chatham has a representative on the subcommittee. The subcommittee has to be renewed by the executive branch of government. Uh, and we have lapsed the subcommittee for about five years now, uh, but it looks like the subcommittee will be renewed and new members will be chosen uh, from each of the six Outer Cape towns, the county and the state. So the subcommittee is a voice to the superintendent. The superintendent is in charge of the management of the park. And here's the first meeting. It's interesting to see that it was a male dominated group at the time with, uh, with the exception of Esther Rolls who was uh, to the uh, left. She was the wealth representative and or Esther Wiles, excuse me. But the rest of the, the men in the group, if you look closely at the photograph, was a heavily smoking group with lots of cigars and cigarettes. 
but the advisory commission plays an important role with the national seashore so as a park employee we have ideas of what is best for preserving the resources and providing recreation but the net but the advisory commission wanted to kind of know everything they wanted to look under the covers they wanted to look under the tarps they wanted to see what was happening in the park and whether it was appropriate based on the legislation so here's the advisory commission members uh smartly dressed out at the great island tavern site this was an archaeological dig that was happening in the late 60s and they wanted to know what was going on and what the plans were for this uh, archaeological feature it's interesting that the advisory commission over the years has also jumped in on issues like jet skiing and nude sunbathing and they also jumped in on this issue which was the park's attempt at creating kind of a new area out of a very remote, pristine area in South Wellfleet called Freshbrook. And the park proposed a tour road going from Nosset Light Beach all the way up to this area. And there would be parking and signs and trails, including this boardwalk, which was uh, created by the park maintenance staff. Well, lo and behold, the advisory commission takes a look at it and says, the Park Service's mission on Cape Cottage does not go into pristine, unspoiled areas. They, they really need to stick with the basics of uh, access to beaches and uh, visitor centers. But what are you doing going into these beautiful, untouched areas? So guess what? The Freshbrook development was stopped by the Advisory Commission. Didn't have the authority to stop it, but convinced the superintendent to do so. And today, if you go out to the Freshbrook Village, there's a couple of uh, no-name unmarked trails and the pilings for this boardwalk still exist today but it's a lesson in how some national park service units have advisory commissions there was no visitor center at first so they used uh, we used a small building right before the orleans rotary off of Route six as the first contact station this is what the lifeguards looked like in the 60s uh, Henry Baston, who's a little hard to see in this photo, he's got the beret on in the doorway, standing next to the governor of Massachusetts. He was honored in a ceremony declaring the outermost house as a literary landmark. And finally, in 1966, the park was officially established uh, with, the create, with the construction of the Salt Pond Visitor Center in East Ham. Here comes several, uh, Senator Saltonstall on the right, and then a very young Ted Kennedy coming up the walkway to give the speeches and to kind of uh, get the park started. Um, so that was 1966. The early park rangers who were hired here patrolled the beach on foot on, with vehicles and with a horse patrol. The horse patrol was very popular. And uh, unfortunately, it's just continued in the night, early 1980s due to cost. Uh, it became very apparent early in the years of the National Seashore that there was a lot of history in the park. It wasn't just for beach recreation, even though the, the initial thinking, big picture in the 50s was preserving the outer beach for recreation. There's all these historic, historic sites, and here, here was one of them. None of the towers still existed on the Marconi site in South Wellfleet, uh, but that's a site that we tell the story of today through uh, educational programs and signage. And now two of the tower bases have since been eroded. And you can see those on the beach today from the air. And the other two tower bases are still on the bluff. So the Marconi story, and I know there's a strong connection with the later station in Chatham, uh, is a story, story that we love to tell here at, at the National Seashore. Right nearby in Wellfleet was Camp Wellfleet. And this is an example of some military lands that were given by the uh, Department of Defense to the National Seashore. And all these buildings were eventually taken down. The Camp Wellfleet had been an anti-aircraft artillery training ground during World War II and up, in, up until the late 50s. So to reclaim a lot of these lands, the, the National Park Service employed these rather curious looking vehicles with uh, there's to the right is a little trailer. There's a lot of beach grass that would be hand uh, fed into a machine that would put plugs of beach grass to reclaim a lot of this land that had been denuded by uh, military activity. Uh, so in 
during the 50s and 60s, the whole National Park Service system was under what's called a building and construction program that was called Mission 66. So the, the uh, emphasis was on building very modern looking visitor centers and park uh, restroom facilities. So the two visitor centers that we built are very modern looking uh, even today with hexagonal roofs, a lot of glass, a lot of steel, and not the old fashioned park ranger stations made like a lot of cabins. Um, the National Park Service also learned some lessons. We don't have big rock concerts at our facility. So here in 1972, there was a, a series of bands that played and it turns out that a lot more people showed up than we had anticipated. This is well before my time, fortunately, at the park. Uh, but things got out of control. The fires were started out in the dunes. Uh, people even tried to start the roof on fire, the visitor center, the Hells Angels group showed up. And so uh, lesson learned there, don't really have any big concerts unless maybe they're classical music. Uh, we know that the visitor uh, visitor center staff and other rangers, uh, they had the, the two different uniforms, which I thought everyone would enjoy. The male uniform, which is basically unchanged to this day that I'm wearing, but the female uniform was the stewardess look, and uh, that eventually changed and all, all employees wear the same uniform. Um, over the years, a lot of important shipwrecks have been uncovered, including the HMS Somerset. 1973. One of my favorite headlines in the archives um, is the bare facts emerging in Truro. This was a nude sunbathing issue from the mid 1970s, uh, which came to a, a peak uh, right around the just south of Balsam Beach in Truro. Um, this was an issue that was eventually resolved and nude sunbathing is no longer a big issue here. Off-road vehicle use, there was no regulations early on in the park's history and people were allowed to drive just about anywhere. You could drive from East Ham up to Provincetown on the Outer Beach, but regulations have come in over the years and now only vehicles with permits that have required equipment can drive on designated routes uh, at the National Seashore. And old uh, businesses that have been operating well before the park, like the arts dune taxis, um, those businesses are allowed to continue. But certain areas of the park we found were too fragile. This was the sand bowl, which we had a, uh, right on the Truro Provincetown line, that had a large parking lot. People could run up and down the dunes and we found that damage to the dunes was too great when you invited large numbers of people via parking lot and signs. So the sand bowl was then closed in the early 80s. Uh, National Seashore actually was able to get a building from Chatham that was in danger of being washed away. The Old Harbor Life Saving Station that was moved by the Park Service in 77 and it's now a museum up at Grace Point on a beach that actually accretes every year um, instead of a road. Uh, and we've had bathhouses that have disappeared because of storms. Some of you remember the Coast Guard Beach bathhouse and parking lot that was lost during the blizzard of 78. So another lesson learned was don't build parking lots too close to the ocean. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of at the National Seashore is the lifeguards that work year after year. The uniforms have changed over time, but uh, they work in very treacherous conditions with the cold water, the currents, and now with the sharks. So they are a crack group of great employees that we have. Someone had mentioned dune shacks. Uh, here's one of the dune shacks, the Euphoria Shack, which are now part of the, uh, the historic district up in uh, Provincetown and Truro. And the dune shacks are famous for a lot of things, but one thing would be the art that has taken place and continues to play, take place there today. Um, so I want you to be thinking about your last questions because we are just about finished on our journey through the park's post-61 history. Um, other discoveries, other cool things that have happened, um, the Karn site archeological site was uncovered in 1990 and a lot of the public got to see that get uncovered and archeologists rushed in to recover as much as we could and some of that materials on display in the park today. 
uh, other pieces of shipwreck that have come up in 2008. This was one of the best pieces that I have seen in my time here uh, with the you know, covering of the bottom part of the schooner. And then as a historian, you know, I appreciate as time rolls on, uh, recent history becomes more historic. And so we've got Marcel Breuer on the right, Serge Tremayot on the left. And these were modern architects that worked on the Outer Cape. And in this case, both in Wellfleet, some of their houses are still out there in the woods today. And the National Seashore actually owns and manages a couple of these historic properties. Um, the Kugel Gibbs house is one, and we lease these to the Cape Cod Modern House Trust. Uh, and the Modern House Trust also uh, maintains and uh, offers for use the Hatch Cottage out on Bombook Island and Wellfleet. Uh, we have the Cerna Cottage at Newcomb Hollow, and this is a very striking building that we now use for vacation rentals. And even employee, employees can live in some of these very interesting and historic modern structures, much like the Wilkinson Cottage. Um, a couple of other big issues before I close up, uh, the Herring River restoration, all the areas in pink here shown in Wellfleet, part of the 1500 acres of the Herring River estuary, those areas are gonna be restored. Um, we clear a lot of vistas and burn a lot of brush. A lot of the vistas are historic vistas like at Fort Hill. And then we've got the shifting sands, the, uh, the new inlet in Chatham in 07. Uh, a lot of questions that we get, does the National Park Service try to armor the coast or protect it? And the answer is no, we let nature usually take its course. And some of those North Beach cottages, which were in the news in 2010-11, because of the uh, vast eroding beach, the National Park Service decided to go ahead and remove the ones that we own that were under special permits to individual families. And uh, you know, this gives you an idea of the the uh, situation that many of them were facing as uh, before they were removed. And in an ironic twist, Francis Biddle's property. Uh, the Biddle family decided to put it up for sale. The National Park Service acquired that Biddle property in 2011. And we have plans to probably lease it out or do tours of the historic grounds. And one of the biggest lingering issues here at the park is uh, houses that are within the boundary getting redeveloped um, into structures that can be, we feel as though they're distracting and detract from the, the uh, the overall character of the uh, 1960s landscape of Cape Cod. So those, those are my formal images. Um, the, we know that in closing, you know, I've dedicated uh, most of my career to working here at the National Seashore and the Berkshire Eagle, which is a paper out in Western Massachusetts near where I'm from, uh, after the signing of the legislation came out and said that this was the finest victory ever recorded for the cause of conservation in New England. And uh, this is me. Uh, if anyone would like to contact me with stories, comments, questions, additional information, um, I can be reached with the email that you see there. And my phone number and extension is there as well. Like I said, my office is in East Ham um, at the Salt Pond Visitor Center. And we'd love to talk to anyone who uh, wants to chat further about this topic. Uh, but before I bid you adieu, um, I'm wondering if there's questions from the chat or comments that we can try to address before the end. There are, there are a few. I think a really good one is how and if were indigenous people participated in the creation of the park and were continuing today and if there's some type of land acknowledgement within the park. So uh, in that establishment ceremony in 1966, there were tribal members in full, uh, full native regalia. Um, and we have photos in the archives of that, but they were you know, really just a rubber stamp, uh, really just a um, um, kind of symbolic. Nowadays, uh, the National Seashore consults with the two federally recognized tribes uh, near to us that have ancestral ties, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the uh, tribe, the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina. 
and they have consulted with us over the years on the new exhibits at the visitor center, uh, special programming. And last summer we had two interns from the tribes who worked in our visitor centers. Um, in terms of official land acknowledgement that is yet to come down through the part channels, um, but I expect that that is coming within, you know, in the, in the near future where the National Seashore or at least the National Park Service would have an official land acknowledgement uh, declaration that would acknowledge formally the ancestral ties that those two tribes and other tribes that are not fairly recognized have to the lands here. Great. And one question is a Kennedy question. It says, is it true that President Kennedy's grand grandfathered the beachcomber uh, because it was a favorite of the family? I don't know. <laughs> uh, that sounds, um, I highly doubt that. Um, the beachcomber in Wellfleet, the building is an old life-saving station from 1873 or it might be 1890s, but it's definitely before 1900. Uh, so I don't know. That's a curious story. If someone wants to send me more on that, we'll include it in the next show if we can back that one up. And I think a lot of people, especially how I was brought up, associate like this was JFK's big legacy. Now, it, does it, is that how it's kind of interpreted from you or I think it was a lot more of the community just per se than just himself signing the yeah in terms of writing the legislation and kind of being it being kind of the brainchild in terms of crafting language uh, Kennedy and his staffers did help when he was a senator in the 50s uh, I believe the, the last official bill that was filed was the Kennedy Salt and Stall Keith bill so his name is on it, and obviously with his connection to Hyannisport, um, I think when it was being debated in Congress and whether it should be passed, and remember this was this was millions of dollars of federally appropriated money to acquire land, which was the first for the Park Service. I think he really helped uh, grease the skids with the congressional delegation and him as president. Um, if he wasn't president, you know, there's a question as to whether the bill would have found passage or not. So I think his greatest legacy would be his stamp on the early language of the legislation, but his sensitivity towards and knowledge of, you know, really the parochial nature of um, New England town government and the importance of individual freedom and control. And I think the legislation reflects his understanding of that system, which is different from other parts of the country. So, you know, the towns retained quite a bit of land in the national seashore boundary. The towns retain the ability to collect money and revenue from town beaches. So I think Kennedy's stamp is really um, both in the legislation, but then also when it rubber hit the road and the Congress had a vote and appropriate money. Now, are your archives available to the public? Like some of those sure, we, Yeah, we have a lot of interesting um, archival material related to the creation of the park. We have the letters of David Martin, who is a legislative assistant for Salt and Stall, I believe. And we have other early letters of support or complaint regarding the proposed legislation. We have quite a bit of that. Um, so, yes, archives are open through appointment through me, and uh, we can get you and show you what we got. Great. Um, there's a few, you know, one was like, why wasn't Nosset Beach part of the National Seashore? But I think you kind of cleared it up with that previous statement. But yeah, is the, it town of, the town of Orleans was, um, if that's the Nosset Beach you're referring to, um, they were quite adamant in maintaining control over that beach. That was uh, an important part of their recreation program that and they had already proven that they could uh, maintain that resource very well. So I think, you know, that was, um, if the towns could kind of prove that they were already doing a lot of the, the heavy lifting with some of these um, park beaches, the, the National Park Service, so that's fine. Um, one question, what have you been some surprises since, since the creation of the seashore? And I think really, how have you seen, has visitation increased 
during the pandemic, like with so many other national parks? And have there been any huge like human interferences with the national seashore? Uh, well, yeah, so we get um, somewhere around 4 million visits per year and our visitation did go way up during COVID, you know, maybe it's 10, 15%, but we're now, we're ranked in the top 10 of national park units for visitation. We got bumped up because of COVID. We never closed the beaches or the trails and really never really closed the park. We closed the two visitor centers in, mm -hmm. on the interior. So we did get a big COVID bump for visitation. Everyone wanted to be outside and recreate, and we all know about that. Um, in terms of biggest surprises, I would say there's two surprises. They're both kind of demographics that I've seen. Um, you know, when I first started here, the story about not sliding through the stop sign and being careful with the, the local population. Um, it's kind of different now in that people will now come up to me and say, why does the park service allow all these private houses in the boundary? Why would we allow vehicles on the beach? What are you doing allowing hunting? Mm -hmm. And so the outlook now is, um, you know, some of the newcomers coming in, they're like, why isn't this like a real national park like Yellowstone where all of that stuff is not allowed and it's just kept pristine. So I, I have to, if I have the time, I'll go into all the compromises that at the time needed to be made by the National Park Service to get this park to even happen. And it's a hard explanation for people coming into it fresh with fresh eyes uh, who weren't here in the 50s during, uh, during all those, um, those tough letters that I read out loud. So I think that's, you know, that's probably one of the biggest biggest changes that I've seen here. And then just the demographics of, um, you know, the original intent, I think, of the creation of the park was to really be able to have anyone um, come here at a pretty low cost, get on the beach, enjoy themselves, take in some of the history and the natural beauty. And, um, you know, and probably could do so at uh, mom and pop campgrounds or little cottages. Um, mm -hmm. And what pops out to me is the affordability issue now with coming to the Cape. Um, if you look at the type of cars that are in our parking lots and the, the type of people that come here, uh, oftentimes it's uh, upper middle class or higher. And so the demographics have really changed. And do we still have here at the National Seashore, do we still offer the ability to, of, of all economic classes to visit here in an affordable way. And a lot of that's out of our control. Uh, we can keep beach fees down, have free trail system and all that, no charge for visitor centers. But, um, you know, the, the whole affordability issue with both people trying to work and live here that we're all familiar with and the visitation and the type of visitors we get based on how expensive it might be to be here. So those are some of the things that I see as big trends that I, I think the park creators didn't really envision mm. uh, 60 years ago. Well, I can say it is the only beach pass that I'm eligible for and can afford. So I do appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> um, a few, one other, I think it's a lot, people are interested. In, what was that, the Karn site that you had just showed a picture of? Uh, so the Karn site was a uh, Native American um, campsite, essentially, uh, that was uh, 2,000 to 1,500 years old. Wow. And uh, a hearth was discovered. Uh, so this was discovered by Dan Carnes, who was a local construction contractor who was, walked to the beach every morning and uh, he was very good at reading soils. And after one of the storms, he saw this, uh, you know, hearth, prehistoric hearth that had firecrack rock in it and um, stone tools and evidence of a native site and uh, alerted the National Seashore in over a two year period we had excavated the site as it was literally being washed away. So uh, the, the artifacts that we have are firecrack rock, um, you know, stone tools, uh, some native pottery, and some of that, like I said, is on display here at the visitor center in our museum. And I think one question, will, it was about what you had said earlier with the statistic when you said that only 6% of the Eastern shoreline was available for public recreation. They're asking, okay, what was the 94%? Was that not available? What was that? Do, what was that? Uh, yeah, it, 
it was not available for the public. Um, so that could have been, you know, the military owned some coastal installations. A lot of it was already privately owned. Um, it, the, the definition of accessible was could anybody from any state uh, show up and maybe for a fee, maybe not get on park somewhere and get on the beach. And that's what the, uh, that's what they were looking at. The, the biggest stretch that was still available was Cape Hatteras. That was the first national seashore that was created um, in the thirties, but not really implemented until the fifties. And then uh, Cape Cod was the second of 10 total national seashores that exist today. So there's Point Reyes, Padre Island, uh, Cape Lookout. Um, but yeah, uh, coastal access. And you know, if you go to um, the shore of Connecticut or New Jersey, you know, you kind of run into that. There's little pockets of parking and accessibility, but oftentimes you have to be a resident. So that didn't meet the definition of accessible. Mm -hmm. I, say, I could say that happens on the Cape too. Yeah. Um, I think the last, it's just more of like, you, you know, what books do you recommend? I know you re recommended one book. Um, anything else you would recommend for people to read about the National Seashore? Well, uh, yeah, so the one book, The uh, Greatest Beach that I showed by Ethan Carr, that's, that's the one that really talks about the creation of the park and, and really its evolution. You have to nibble around the edges with other books. Um, but that's really the best one off the top of my head. There was a book created for the 50th anniversary uh, that Images of America series that uh, is about Cape Cod National Seashore, some great early images of the park, which I'm going to grab right now. And uh, I'm not sure if it's still in print or not, but uh, that's a nice publication. So. Okay. Um one person, one question was, was the, the, the shipwreck of the Wida, was that found on national uh, seashore waters? Right, so the pirate ship Wida, which, and there's a museum in um, Yarmouth that tells the story of the Wida, the pirate ship, um, a lot of, a lot of artifacts and coins and the bell of the ship were recovered and there's a great museum there, I highly recommend it. Um, that was found within the boundary of Cape Cod National Seashore off the shore of Wellfleet, not too far from Marconi site. But the, the, uh, the bottom land, the submerged bottom land off of Wellfleet is uh, under state, state jurisdiction. And so the uh, Barry Clifford and the Witta expedition recovered uh, materials through a permit through the Army Corps of Engineers and through the state and the National Seashore does not have jurisdiction on the bottomlands, submerged bottomlands. So, but it is technically was found within the boundary of the National Seashore. Okay, well, that's everything I've got for you, Bill. Thank you. Well, thank, uh, thank everyone for listening. I hope you're still listening. And- uh, yeah, Bill, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, um, your calm during the uh, uh, technical uh, snafu and, uh, and, and you did a great job and, and, and I'm, uh, thank you for everything that you've uh, contributed tonight. And, uh, um, and uh, we, we look forward to uh, having you maybe in the, in the near future again to talk about other things. So thank you very much. Thank you everybody for attending. We greatly appreciate it. And then we hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Take care, thank you. <laughs>